welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us for our first 2019 show. In this week's show, how pro-life lawmakers plan to advance legislation in a divided Congress. We speak with U.S. Representative Jody Heiss. A pro-abortion writer wants YouTube to artificially hide pro-life videos, including our own. We speak out. And this. The more you think about it and you think about the different path your life is going to be on, um, then you really start to realize that God has a different idea for our family. Hear how a Catholic community supports moms blessed with children who have disabilities. But first, we address a bombshell New York Times report on how Planned Parenthood allegedly discriminates against pregnant employees. The paper reported that more than a dozen current and former employees of the nation's largest abortion provider accused the organization of mistreating and ousting pregnant staff. The women featured in the article said Planned Parenthood managers in some facilities declined to hire pregnant job candidates, refused requests for breaks for expecting mothers, try to pressure new moms to return from maternity leave too early and in some instances fired them after they gave birth. Joining us now is Talisa Hairston, a woman who was prominently featured in the New York Times article. We're speaking to her via Skype from New Haven, Connecticut for her first television interview. Talisa, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. First of all, can you tell us about your pregnancy journey for your youngest son and any complications that you had? Yes, yeah, so in the end of my pregnancy, I actually developed preeclampsia and it's a condition where your blood pressure reaches a really high limit. There's swelling in your feet, hands and face. And it was so bad that I was put on bed rest multiple times until March 23rd, I was actually admitted to the hospital where I had to stay until my due date, which was April 30th. And then they performed an emergency C-section the next day because they said my liver was going to rupture and I would die. Oh my goodness. I'm glad that you and your son are healthy now. And Talisa, you told the New York Times that Planned Parenthood required you to work a longer day, which went against your doctor's orders. Can you tell us about that and what happened because of that? Yes, um, so I worked a lot of long shifts at Planned Parenthood and the last one I worked was actually a 10 hour shift. I worked an eight to eight and it did snow that night. It was really bad and the next day, the Monday I came into work and the nurse said, you have to go home. And she said, I don't care who gets mad, like you have to leave. I went to the doctor and then they put me on bed rest. And they said, this is really bad. Like you have to think about your pregnancy. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what they mm -hmm. say at work anymore. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything just kind of spiraled out of control. What would happen to Lisa when you would ask for lunch breaks? I wouldn't get one. Or if I did go on lunch, I was pulled out of the lunchroom to see patients. When you did have your son, Talisa, did Planned Parenthood respect your earned maternity leave? How did they treat you during that time? In the beginning, they were very kind. And then as a week passed, they said that they did not receive notice from my doctor that I did deliver the baby. They didn't have my FMLA paperwork. And I told them that my doctor had sent it a week, two weeks before when I was placed on immediate bed rest. And then shortly after I was getting calls stating that I had to come back to work. And my son had just came home from the NICU. He hadn't even been a month old. Mm. And I know with FMLA, like I can stay home for up to three months. It's 12 weeks if you have a C-section and it wasn't even the 12 weeks yet. And they were telling me that I had to return to work. I did let them know that I was not notified through mail with the letter stating I had to return to work and how, I, how was I supposed to know these things? And it's a week later that I have to go to work. Sounds like you were really on top of it in all the paperwork and following protocol. Yes. So to clarify, Talisa, how did your employment at Planned Parenthood 
come to an end? It came to an end when I requested for paid family leave. It's a leave that started last, well, last January. And it's for bonding with newborns where you can get extra time off and it mm -hmm. is paid. I requested that and two of the women from HR said that I was not eligible for it. I can either do one week unpaid leave, 30 days, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. one week of PTO, 30 days unpaid leave or tenure my resignation. And with all of the stress that I felt, and it's actually making me tear up now, mm -hmm. with all of the stress that I felt, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. felt that it was best to just leave because the way I was treated throughout my whole pregnancy and maternity leave, I couldn't enjoy my son or get myself better again to take care of him. As I mentioned to Lisa, you were prominently featured in, the, in that New York Times article. What was it like working with those reporters for the piece? They were awesome. They mm -hmm. supported me throughout the entire process. They actually cried a few times when I let them know my story because I still get emotional off of it. So I can imagine anyone that didn't go through it, it kind of, it touches them in a place as well. And one of the reporters were, she was actually pregnant mm -hmm. and she said she couldn't imagine if this were to happen to her as well. And I told her, hopefully, this never happens to anybody. So finally, Talisa, again, thank you for your time. And hearing about this experience, I just want to end it in asking you, if there's anyone who might be considering a career at Planned Parenthood, what would you want to tell that woman? I would tell them to think twice and know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And I would tell them just turn the other way. There's better opportunities out there. I work for a great, a great place now and mm -hmm. I'm respected. Mm -hmm. And that's what's very important because if you're going to give healthcare, I feel like if something happened to one of us, it should be back in return. And people should respect us. To Lisa Hairston, thank you for your courage and sharing your story and thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Thank you. We did reach out to Planned Parenthood for comment on this investigation. Planned Parenthood responded by directing us to their press release from their president, Dr. Leanna Wen, stating in part, as a doctor, a public health leader, and a mother, I am deeply disappointed by a recent New York Times article that included allegations about our organization not living up to our high standards and policies. For confidentiality reasons, we cannot comment on specific allegations. But make no mistake, if concerns are raised or complaints brought, we investigate immediately and, where necessary, take decisive action. Dr. Wen's statement also included news that the abortion business is launching a major new initiative to, quote, review, revamp, and strengthen parental leave policies to, quote, ensure a culture that supports pregnant and parenting staff. To continue this conversation, we are joined in studio by Mallory Quigley, the Vice President of Communications for the Susan B. Anthony List. And joining us via satellite is Annette Lancaster, who used to manage a Planned Parenthood facility, but is now a part of And Then There Were None, a nonprofit that exists to help abortion clinic workers leave the abortion industry. Thank you both for being here with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Mallory, first off, what is your reaction to this investigation and to what Talisa shared with us? Gosh, well, wow. And thank God that Talisa is in good health and her mm -hmm. son is as well. Uh, it's really no surprise when you think about the pressure that Planned Parenthood exerts on the pregnant women that come into their doors. I mean, mm -hmm. nine out of 10 women who are pregnant walk out of Planned Parenthood having been undergone or sold an abortion. Mm. And so it really, it makes sense and it's not really a surprise that they would exert this level of pressure on their employees as well and to create an environment that isn't just hostile to the unborn child but to the mother. I mean preeclampsia is a very serious condition for pregnant women and um, you know for an organization whose motto is health care no matter what, I mean I think that this investigation uh, directly contradicts that as we know. And Annette, I understand you spoke with the New York Times at length for this report. What did you share with the reporters? How was the culture at Planned Parenthood? Um, well, the culture was very dark. 
um, one of the things that I spoke out about was that they were um, very uh, biased towards our pregnant employees. Um, I actually had a pregnant staff member um, who was terminated mm -hmm. and um, then later on I left and went out of the country for vacation and when I came back one of our senior members of man management um, ended up being terminated and to me it was very ironic that she had been speaking out about her pregnancy um, and then when I come back she was automatically just gone and I was told to have no communication with her so you know like I said to the New York Times if it was one time it would have been coincidence but that the fact that it happened twice uh, mm -hmm. was very curious to me. Mm -hmm. Mallory, what did you make of how Planned Parenthood President Dr. Leanna Wen responded? Well, I mean, it's more of the same. You know, she came in um, trying to focus on health care. You know, she is coming from a medical background, less political than her predecessor. Uh, but I think that this, this is just a continuation of the status quo at Planned Parenthood, which is proving itself time and again to be an abortion business. Annette, it sounds as if you did, in fact, witness your pregnant coworkers being discriminated against. What else do you want to share that you think Americans would be surprised to learn about how Planned Parenthood treats pregnant employees? Oh, there is so, there is so much that goes on behind the scenes that the um, American population just does not know. Um, they do not provide health care, they do, they do not provide um, maternity leave, they do not provide anything for mm -hmm. the pregnant um, employees. Um, one of the things that Planned Parenthood stresses is not taking time off, although they do offer it, um, and I guess that's because it's, you know, legally obligatory, mm -hmm. but um, they do not allow a lot of taking of time off to go to doctor's appointments and things of that nature. So when you're pregnant, you're definitely going to need to take a lot of time off. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the reasons that was behind those two employees being suddenly terminated. Mallory, do you see this New York Times report having any repercussions for Planned Parenthood? I certainly hope so. I mean, it's more it's more fuel to the fire um, you know, on top of, you know, their annual reports and other information, the, mm -hmm. the witness of, of former Planned Parenthood employees like Annette and, and Talisa. And I think that, you know, <laughs> the timing of this was really unfortunate. It came mm -hmm. right before the Christmas holiday when people are That's not right. paying as much attention. But this is something that we need to... Um, continue to point out and and the witness of of the women that are working with and then there were none is so incredible and so powerful so I hope that this will be, be a wake-up call to some people that are maybe still working inside the abortion industry and might get out after having this 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 report absolutely and Annette on that note finally if there is someone who works at Planned Parenthood who happens to catch this program what do you want to say to that person I I just want to beg and plead to those people, especially those that know me that still work at the Chapel Hill location. Um, you know the culture, you know the ambiance. Just get out. Um, you know, it's almost like the, that movie that just came out recently called Get Out. <laughs> like you, you get sucked into this dark culture and you end up culminating to that and you end up becoming part of it and you really can't see your way out, but I would just stress to them and beg to them, just really look beyond what you're doing and you know, really see the truth of the matter and just get out. Thank you for your witness. Annette Lancaster of And Then There Were None and Mallory Quigley of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you both for being with us. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. The Department of Health and Human Services recently issued a new rule directing insurers selling Affordable Care Act plans that cover elective abortion to collect a separate payment from all enrollees for that coverage. It's required by law. But under the Obama administration, insurers were allowed to collect these payments in a single transfer of funds in violation of clear statutory language. This new rule is a great step from the HHS department, but we need them to finalize it. 
And that's where you come in for this week's Call to Action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com so you can submit a comment in support of the separate payments rule. We have drafted language already to make it easy for you, but you have the freedom to edit the comment and make it your own. Here's why this is important. Requiring an actual separate collection of the abortion surcharge will decentivize abortion coverage in Obamacare and save lives. It will also ensure premium payers are aware of the abortion surcharge so no one is paying for abortion coverage they don't want. Consumers have a right to know if they are funding abortion coverage, and by demanding the HHS department separate the collection of the abortion surcharge, it will be more clear for consumers. Submit a comment in support of this pro-life rule by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Moving now to our next story, with a new year comes a new Congress, and pro-lifers face an uphill battle having lost control of the House of Representatives. What does this mean for pro-life priorities, from defunding Planned Parenthood to the topic of a recent Capitol Hill hearing on fetal tissue funding? It seems to me that there's a lot of talk these days about a wall being built. I think emphatically there should be a wall built between the taxpayer dollars and the use of those dollars going toward aborted baby parts and the research thereof. Representative Jody Heiss of Georgia is the vice chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Government Operations. He joins us now from Capitol Hill. Congressman, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. An honor to be here. Congressman, in the hearing, you said there should be a wall built between taxpayer dollars and the use of these dollars going toward aborted baby parts and the research thereof. Can you expand on that? Absolutely. I believe it with all my heart. Never should the taxpayer funds be going towards abortions or uh, research of, of, of aborted fetal tissue. There should absolutely be a distinct wall that prevents taxpayer funds from going to research of aborted fetal tissue. Congressman, as we begin this new year and this new Congress and the House moves into Democratic control, Do you see any opportunities to advance pro-life legislation? Well, there's no doubt it's going to be more challenging. As we all know, the Democrat Party as a whole is not pro-life, and they have have done in the past, and I'm sure will continue to do everything they possibly can to stop and to shut down the advancement of pro-life causes. But that by no means means that we're going to wave a white flag of surrender. We're going to continue to stand for life. We're going to continue to stand for the rule of law. How will you try to persuade your colleagues who might think differently than you on the life issue to vote pro-life? Well, I mean, this is a continual battle. You know, I have in years past and will continue to, pa- uh, to, to drop bills like the Sanctity of Human Life bill. Uh, I'm uh, a strong supporter of the uh, Heartbeat bill. Uh, I mean, there's a host of bills that we have dropped and passed in the House defending life. And, you know, as a, as a whole, we just continue to keep that message out front of our conference. And I think we're, we're making great uh, advances in that regard. And I feel overall that our conference is, is, is more pro-life than not. The challenge now, obviously, is going to be with the change of parties uh, and how we're going to successfully be able to move our agenda forward as it relates to life. But we're going to continue the battle in every way that we possibly can. Your background, Congressman, I think our viewers would be interested to know, is in Christian ministry. You've served as a senior pastor and as the vice president of the Georgia Baptist Convention. From your perspective as pastor, how do you view the abortion issue? Now listen, God is the creator of life. This is not a human decision. This is a God thing. But even beyond that, we know that inside the womb, a moment of conception, is a human being. It's not a blob of tissue. Science has proven this. So whether we're talking about this from a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective, or just simply from a scientific perspective, we know uh, what is inside the womb at conception. It's a human being, and that is something that deserves protection. And and even our Constitution in the preamble uh, talks about all the rights that are laid out in in the Constitution, but they are reserved for both us and our posterity, which in itself is those future generations yet to be born. So I believe you can even argue from a constitutional perspective that life should be protected. Representative Jody Heiss of Georgia, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, thank you so much. When we come back. In her own way, she 
has evangelized us and helped us to be better people. How a group of mothers who have children with disabilities are coming together in a special way. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A pro-abortion writer says YouTube altered its search results on abortion after she complained about pro-life videos. That's this week's Speak Out segment. Writing in Slate, April Glasser objected to the prominence of pro-life videos and YouTube's top results when one searches for abortion. She dismissed these pro-life videos as, quote, gory videos rife with misinformation. The videos she objected to included live actions medical animations of the most common abortion procedures, which are medically accurate, and one of our own Speak Out segments from this show, in which we explain why abortion, which ends a life, should not be considered a human right. That information we shared in the video is undeniably accurate and fact-checked by our own team here at EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. There is no misinformation or gore. Despite the best efforts of pro-abortion activists, manipulating search results cannot change the ugly truth about what abortion really is, a procedure that ends an innocent life. It's hypocritical for those who claim to champion choice to artificially hide real choices. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com so you can submit a comment in support of the separate payments rule. When a parent learns their child has a special needs diagnosis, it can be scary and isolating. But for this week's Pro-Life Focus, we introduce you to a group of moms who want you to know you are not alone. My name is Louise May Francis. Lucy Whitman and my age is I'm 16 years old. Lucy is kind of like the exclamation point at the end of our family. Um, it's like one of my daughters once said, you know, without Lucy, we'd all be just kind of boring. <laughs> she is super fun, super extroverted, and she has this warmth about her. Lucy is a light for her family, but one that came about unexpectedly for the Whitmans. Lucy came along late in our life. We had had four children, and um, there had been a space of 11 years without any children. We had a couple miscarriages, and I was just so sure that it was over, and then lo and behold, I found out I was expecting. So by the grace of God, she's a healthy child, and you know, and we found out definitively at birth that she did have Down syndrome. The Down syndrome diagnosis was a surprise, one that other families were facing as well. Fiona has four older brothers and one younger brother, and she is now 15 and has Down syndrome. Catholic mother Sally Crocker first met Whitman at a Christian support group in Virginia for families raising children with special needs. But 10 years ago, after meeting another Catholic mom there, the three decided to create a group specifically for Catholic mothers called Special Blessings Moms. The thing about being a mom of a person with special needs is that it, you are somewhat isolated and there aren't that many families around you. And I did have the f good fortune to meet Sally and she also has a daughter with Down syndrome and we just decided we were gonna do this and I'm so glad we did. The concept is simple. They meet once a month at All Saints Catholic Church in Manassas, Virginia to build community, share resources, and hear from expert guest speakers. The group has been a gift for these families already. For example, following years of therapy, Crocker's daughter Fiona was nonverbal. But after connecting with a special speech therapist she learned about at a meeting, her daughter finally reached a breakthrough and just in time for a special day. We just started this therapy in July and her birthday is on August 10th. And for the first time in her life at the age of 15, she actually blew out her candles and the whole room just went insane. 
While these mothers truly view their children as blessings, they can also empathize with the unique journey raising a child with special needs entails. Well, I think the biggest value has been being together and knowing that you're not alone. You know, and, and it is truly amazing meeting other parents who are carrying sometimes very heavy loads with severe disabilities, others with Down syndrome or autism, and just getting to know them and sharing the faith with each other, it's been wonderful. It's been a big blessing. I would say our group has been a huge comfort to talk with other parents who understand where you're coming from and really encourage you not to be afraid. The smaller in-person community extends to a larger group online. Whether on the web or face to face, these mothers have gained a powerful perspective to share. In her own way, she has evangelized us and helped us to be better people. Fiona is extremely lovable. Um, you know, I had a friend tell me, and there's no better expression, that she never has a bad day. Like, she always has a smile on her face, no matter what happens. I'm sure I've never seen her angry, perhaps disappointed occasionally, but she thinks the whole world is there for her, and so everywhere we go, we meet everyone, whether I want to or not. <laughs> um, you know, that's really her mission in life, is to say hello to everybody. Um, so she's, she's a happy, special little girl. They hope other moms walking this path know they're not alone either. And they too can cultivate this kind of community. Well, I know how it is. And I know that in many places there is no group like this. And I would totally encourage that, that person to contact the priest and see if you can get a room, advertise it in the neighboring parishes, as well as your own, and see what happens. That does it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. But until next time, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or like my public page on Facebook. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.